dear colleagues, Zaya Grigorovna in her presentation and her speech about uh, Professor Baryshnikov told that Professor Novikov was uh, his teacher. And it's a well-known, uh, quite a renowned Russian and Belarusian scientist, a Soviet scientist. I, and I'm not his uh, relative, although you might have guessed so, but uh, it so happened that I was one of the uh, Anatoly's students, and I was the first one to defend my doctor's thesis under his uh, leadership and under his supervision. He was giving me consultations. Well, basically speaking, he was my scientific advisor. And after I uh, defended my doctor's thesis, related to monoclonal antibodies, I was faced with my next life's choice, what to do next. So we sat together with Anatoly, we uh, thought it over, and uh, we uh, thought it, could be, it, it, it uh, would be good to go into a different track, into a different uh, scientific field. We wanted to uh, explore the um, solvable differentiated molecules. And this research was possible because uh, Anatoly's lab produced monoclonal antibodies, many different variants and options of antibodies. And um, since the 90s, those antibodies were applied across various um, uh, areas. And uh, first and foremost, they were applied to ensure typing of cells, same antibodies were produced as immunotherapeutic drugs, as immunotherapeutic substances, and this work continues until now. Same antibodies or hybridomes that produce antibodies served as the basics for geoengineering and gene engineering work and studies. And yet another track that we embarked upon was a research of not the membrane forms of differentiated antibodies, but uh, we wanted to do research of solvable forms of antibodies and uh, just a compatibility molecules. Today we know about 400 of such molecules. Well, let me specify. These are the uh, molecules that were classified. There are about 400 molecules that are present at the surface of uh, immune system cells. These are the so-called, this is the so-called CD immune system. And amongst those 400 names, one third of them, has not just a membrane form, but also a solvable form. Uh, they might be more than one third, but uh, this is what is known for now. And I'm showing you the first half a hundred of uh, differentiating molecules and a couple of just uh, compatibility molecules as well. What I'm showing in red are the molecules for which we know They're solvable isoforms, so they have a, a solvable pair, a solvable couple. And asterisks denote those anti-genes for which uh, Anatoly produced uh, developed monoclonal antibodies. And it allowed us to go forward with this, and um, we could have, we could research the whole structure, the pool of differentiating molecules we were investigating their functional roles and what those molecules are meant, what role those molecules are meant to play. Now, the formation of solvable uh, forms uh, happens in two ways. The first way is the so-called proteolytic shedding or cleavage. 
this cleavage is a uh, strictly regulated process. For a very long time, it was believed that it's like getting rid of uh, the molecules that are no longer needed. It's like uh, dumping waste of a sort. But basically, it's a, it, it seems like uh, these uh, protein molecules uh, participate in the immune system regulation, and they produce a whole class, we call it a pool, of regulatory molecules. And those molecules in their function are similar to cytogenes. I think they overlap. Well, part of cytokines are sometimes called solvable differentiating molecules as well. The second way by means of which those uh, differentiating molecules can occur is by means of alternative splicing of pre-matrix RNA. So it's a targeted formation of a solvable form of a molecule. And quite often, it happens uh, in parallel with the membrane form formation. So in parallel, we have both forms the membrane form and the solvable form, each of which uh, is aimed to play, is meant to play its own role in the immune response, in the overall immune response. So as the result of those two processes, we get a, um, a pool of solvable differentiating molecules and just compatibility molecules, which May, which may organize themselves as monomers, so single protein molecules, or oligomers, which can, well, and they can look like dimers or trimers or some even more complicated structures, and you can see it schematically on this slide here. Apart from mo monomer and uh, oligomer forms or polymer forms, we can have associates or complexes, as we call them, that are similar to the structures we see when cells interact between each other uh, in the course of an immune response, of an immune response. One of the simplest version, one of the simplest structure forms of such a complex is the usual shredding or cleavage of those molecules from the cell surface, as it is shown on this slide here. Uh, yeah, this slide exactly demonstrates us how this shedding takes place. Shedding takes place, I'm sorry. And uh, the subsequent activation of T lymphocytes requires uh, those cells requires those cells to diverge. And for these cells to diverge, we need to see certain uh, interaction between protein molecules that form those bridges. So one of the ways of um, um, cutting those contacts is actually cleaving. It's shedding of those molecules from the cell surface. And since on the cell surface, those proteins rarely act all by themselves. They usually react in ensembles, and that's how they leave the cell surface into the surrounding environment, uh, also in ensembles. And after the cleavage, after the shedding, those proteins retain their functions uh, in relation to ligands. So this function may modulate. I mean, the power of interaction uh, may change. But the active center that ensures uh, this uh, cooperation with ligand remains. And uh, th th this uh, pertaining of uh, an active center leads to immunomodulating effect. And each membrane molecule might also serve as a prototype for various series of solvable forms of the same molecule. 
Let me give you an example of a well-known uh, FOS antigen. If you look at it, you'd see that FAS antigen lives into the solution or is uh, freed onto the solution thanks to shedding and splicing of RNA with subsequent secretion of solvable forms. But solvable forms of FAS antigens are different here. You see, there's some forms that have a structure that is very similar to its membrane counterpart, or there are forms that have a truncated structure. And within such structures of protein molecules, we can have only one domain that uh, ensures uh, interaction with FAS ligand. In one case, this cutting or this cleavage occurs from the membrane, from the surface of the, mal, of, the, of the cell. And in the second case, due to the splicing, we can get various forms of solvable FAS antigen. And those forms might be both monomer and polymer, oligomer. So it means that we are left with a, a wide variety of various structures in the end. And those structures can actually perform different functions. And that aggravates the situation even further. Now, using monoclonal antibodies of the ECO series, uh, Baryshnikov series, we produced a number of methodological approaches by means of which we could uh, identify solvable forms of a whole range of various molecules, differentiating molecules. And I'm showing you the list of them. Not all of us. It's not an exhaustive list here. These are the solvable differentiating molecules. Uh, also, thanks to it, we, ma we can uh, identify oligomer fractions of those molecules, as well as associations of those molecules floating in the empty space, in the void. And now the function of this uh, varied population of uh, protein molecule can be different. There are actually two options. Uh, there are two features. There are two functions that those uh, protein molecules can play or can uh, render the most uh, popular most frequently met function is inhibition. It inhibits the processes that occur in between the cells when the cells interact. Quite often, it leads to a blockade of adhesion process, a blockade of cell activation. But again, depending on the nature of this solvable molecule, the inhibition might turn into activation. For example, there's been a number of well-known cases where it was shown that uh, MK1 molecule, which is a solvable dimer, is capable of not just inhibiting this intercell interaction, but uh, and, and, and it usually serves as a, an intercell adhesion molecule, but actually it activates the cells. IK1 monomer usually serves as an inhibitor of intercell adhesion. So the result of this research led us to finally uh, understand that solvable differentiating molecules and just compatibility molecules are Yet another class, another group of factors that participate in the immune response. And we've built a model like this. It's a model of a global immunological network that, of course, is not exhaustive and doesn't contain all the possible components. But the main thing that I would like to demonstrate to you in this example is, and I'm sorry for this, OK, so we have solvable forms of membrane antigens of immune cells. 
and they are yet uh, another component of this global immune network. They're yet another stakeholder in this network. So how those solvable differentiating molecules actually work? What do they do? Um, it seems like my slides are jumping up and down, but uh, I'd like to give you an example here. And uh, let's have a look at the fast molecule. So here we see, again, this uh, variety of potential actions, this variety of potential functions. Well, first, if you have solvable fast molecules there, it might just impede its interaction, fast interaction with the ligand. And because of that, uh, various apoptotic processes can uh, disrupt. It disrupts the apoptotic processes. Well, it doesn't disrupt them. It modulates them, right? It's a, more, it's a better term for the search of the better word. And uh, this form of FAS, well, FAS might uh, impact T lymphocytes in a different way if MFAS is a trimere here, then when it interacts with uh, the membrane FAS ligand, it might lead to a death of T cell. And that will suppress the immune response, right? But it will be of a different nature, of a different genesis. Uh, also, solvable FAS might integrate, may integrate into this membrane structure of trimers that are formed by membrane molecules, and it also disrupts this uh, interaction between T cell and uh, uh, the, the target cell. But the situation might be even worse. It might be even more difficult. Let me, let me show it to you. Let me just skip a couple of slides here. Uh, so where does this difficulty lie in? Because of this alternative splicing, the FAS antigene might uh, generate, produce several solvable forms. They may be a dominating form, and they may be a number of minor forms. And it is believed that those minor forms have a regulatory, they, they, they play a regulatory function. And this function impacts This in impacts this interaction between fast and fast ligand. Am I running out of time? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, so we built a couple of models. Uh, we were trying to demonstrate how those solvable differentiating molecules uh, act and how they work. Here's, for example, a model that demonstrates how solvable SHLA molecules, class one react uh, to the uh, cell surface. And again, it is dependable on this fast and fast ligand interaction. CD38, and the way it is uh, supplied to tumor nodes is also impacted seriously by solvable forms. Um, in the end, uh, we can use this data to monitor uh, the success of uh, polychemical therapy. It is based on identifying the level of uh, solvable molecules. Same fast molecules are showing here, but we can get similar data for CD38 in uh, a similar fashion. And I'm just skipping some of the slides, and I would like to give you some recent data. We've been discussing it with Anatoly Boryshnikov quite extensively just one week before he, is, before he uh, left us. Uh, we've been looking at the pool of differentiating solvable molecules with uh, oncological diseases, and we are listing some of the uh, some of the facts and figures here. And uh, It allowed us to find out, to identify uh, the factors that would ensure a more favorable prognosis for patients with uh, cervix tumors, cervix cancers. And again, 
you could see that uh, we're using some indicators that uh, tell us about the total amount of um, um, solvable forms uh, and uh, oligomer forms, all of those things, they are important to understand in order to come up with a prognosis. And I'm listing you the team that participated in this scientific endeavor. And thank you very much for listening. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen, to the speaker, please?